Welcome to week four. Uh, we're going to start doing physical database design. And essentially what we're going to be doing is taking the conceptual diagrams we took last week and actually convert them to something that can be used physically in a database. Um, so a database design, as opposed to a ERD, is a speci specification that's designed to actually be implemented on a server. And it will change depending what server it's for. Essentially, you take your ERD, it gets transformed into a database design. So since the data model, the ERD is, is generalized, it's not specific, um, it's really good to uh, figure out what people need and then use a specific design tool um, to prepare it for the actual physical implementation. So when you're implementing it for a physical target, you're targeting something like MySQL or Microsoft SQL Server, Oracle, Postgres, and each of those database engines have specific tools for them. Some are better than others. Uh, the one from MySQL is not bad. The one from Microsoft SQL Server is pretty decent. The one from Oracle is pretty good. Um, and then there's lots of third-party tools that also do it that'll do value-added stuff like version control and converting a database diagram into UML diagrams, that kind of stuff. So a database design is logical design plus some physical design. Last week we spoke at length about the conceptual designs. The logical design is the next step. And then we apply physical characteristics to it and that becomes a physical schema or a physical design. Um, so what we're going to talk about specifically today is basically logical design plus some physical design elements, such as the data types. So some of the common tasks include requiring gather uh, requirements gathering, like business rules, normalization, and diagramming. And requirements gathering, we discussed sort of last week. Normalization is for next week. Uh, diagramming, we're going to finish talking about today. Um, however. Remember last week where I kind of rushed in and threw in business rules really quick at you guys? Uh, here are the actual slides for it. I just wanted you guys to at least have the basics of it before so you could start thinking about your assignments. So a business rule is a statement of policy and describes operations. What a process validates but does not in describe how it's enforced or conducted or even how it's implemented. So business rules are set up to allow an organization to achieve its goals and objectives, obviously. if What's the point of having a business rules for a business if it's not to further the business's goals? Um, and it can apply to pretty much anything that belongs to the company, such as its staff, processes, systems, that kind of stuff. Uh, and a sample of a business rule, um, an organization called ABC Tech uh, could have a policy of purchase items worth 5000 and above in one year period, a discount on their purchases. That's actually a very complex rule. Um, the rule rule would be reworded as long as a customer spends over five thousand dollars in one year period, then give ten percent discount on each items purchased by the customer. There's, I'm not even going to ask the question because there's lots of companies that do those kinds of discounts. It just most of you probably have never worked for one that deals in that kind of volume. Um, so, business rules are the foundation of a data model. They represent the language and structure of an organization. Um, obviously, I already mentioned that it has to do with policies and procedures. And business constraints are specified in the business rules. Uh, the business rules provide a formal way to understand an organization by all the stakeholders involved. So the business rules will determine the data used in creation, storage, retrieval, and administration. Uh, they're usually known as constraints. Um, constraints are usually seen in the ERD. That's when you're drawing the crow's foot that says, you know, one to many, many to many, uh, required, not required. Uh, they're important for database design. 
Um, so when you're creating business rules, there are characteristics that are very important. And they are as follows. They, it has to be declarative, declarative. I can't never say that word. The business rules, a statement of policy describes what a process validates. <coughs> it is literally a statement. Students will be on time for class. That's a business rule. Precise, a rule must have only one interpretation amongst all interested people, and this meeting must be clear. Again, students must be on time for class. That's clear. It tells you who, what, and where, or when. Another sample of a valid business rule is a customer must purchase something. That's a clear, simple business rule. Everybody understands what it is because if somebody walks into the store, doesn't buy anything and walks out, they're not a customer. They were a browser, just a body in the building. Atomic, a rule is indivisible, yet sufficient. That means that when you write a business rule, it has to be self-contained, it explains the entire concept and cannot be subdivided into smaller ideas. So, for example, again, um, to use an example from one of the labs, a supervisor manages a department. So, that's indivisible. You can't there's no two rules mixed in together, just a single rule. It can't be broken down and it's self-contained. Expressible. A business rule must be able to be stated in natural language without misrepresentation or misinterpretation. If somebody gives you a business rule and it's hard to understand, it's not a good business rule. Yes, you, depending what language it's written in. I don't mean like computer language. like. You know, if it's written in English and English isn't your first language, the business rule might be hard to understand. However, if you have a solid understanding of the English language, you should be able to read the rule and understand it. Um, when I went through college and they were teaching us about business rules, the concept was if you can write a rule that a child in grade five can understand, it's just right for every manager out there. I don't know how many of you have had managers, but you probably understand exactly what I'm talking about. Distinct. Business rules are not redundant. In other words, you don't write rules multiple times. They may refer to other rules, such as um, an employee must punch in, like it must you know, punch in when they come into the office for businesses that run like on a specific time clock. For example, you go to McDonald's. If you work at McDonald's, you punch in at your start of your shift, you punch out at the end of your shift. You could also say an employee may not work more than so many hours in a shift after they've punched in. So the one business rule is referring to another business rule, but they are not redundant because they are covering two different topics. So that's business rules. Now, the business rules affect how you, yes. Yeah, okay, no, no, but these business rules have more to do with how the data is managed. When you think about a business with a rule, for example, McDonald's, again, you, you're going to go work at McDonald's, you must have non-slip shoes. That is not a, that's a rule of the business, but not a business rule. They don't care where you buy your shoes. They don't care how old they are. They just care that you have them on your feet. Those are policy rules. On the other hand, them saying an employee will not be paid unless they type punch into the time clock, that's something that generates data. Thus, that's a business rule. There's a slight difference between operational rules and business rules that manage the data. So like I said, the, technically the business rule would be employees must have non-slip shoes. Uh, I don't know how many people here have worked at McDonald's, but after the first little bit, they don't even look at your feet. They just checked, oh yeah, those are non-slip non -slip shoes. They're shoals from Walmart, good enough. And they never look at your feet again. 
It's not like they every single day you go in, they do a shoe inspection. If the bit, well, business rules are the rules that govern the data generated by a company. So punching into a time clock is data being generated. Um, another business rule must be a customer must pay for their order before they receive their food. That's a business rule. That means that the order cannot be released to the customer until you've received payment. Otherwise, you're just giving food away. Here's your food. Oh, can you pay? Oh, he's out the door. Right? It's one of those as a policy, as in the sense of you don't let people walk out the door with free food. The other one's a business rule, as in the sense that the order cannot be released without payment. It's just like Amazon will never ship you something unless they take your money first. Right? That is both a policy and a business rule. One's a policy of operation, making sure that, you know, processes are done right. But the other one is it's generating data that the company needs to manage. Therefore, an order cannot move down the stages in their data system unless certain rules are met before it gets to there. Those are the business rules. Some of them only deal with the fact that, you know, an order may have one or more items in it. That's a business rule. Very simple business rule. That is, has nothing to do with the interface. It has nothing to do with, you know, people taking orders. It's just, it's a business rule saying that it's not a valid order unless there's one thing in it. So that is a constraint of how the data is handled. Does that make things a little clear? Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, at this case, it would be a, pol a policy rule and also just one of politeness. Because it's disruptive when, you know, I think today was 18 that were late. When 18 people come in over a five-minute period, it's very disruptive once the lecture has started. So it is a policy that you're supposed to be at your desk on, or sitting down on time. It's not something I can enforce. There's no business rule behind it. It's a, In this case, it's literally just a policy rule. I, like, I cannot enforce these rules. There's no enforcement to these rules. Oh, absolutely. If I could lock these doors at four o'clock and then you can't walk in, that could be a business, an actual business rule because then I could hit a button and the door's locked. It's a process. Anybody else coming in late after that? Well, you know, you got to sign an apology letter. Just, you know, there's things we could put in rule in place for that. It's just, yeah, there's a slightly difference between a policy where it's just a general rule or this is how it's done versus um, an actual generates data kind of thing. And then how is the data being ma maintained? But yeah, those are, you know, that's business rules. So essentially rules are straightforward. They're clear, they're short and simple. The simpler it is, the easier it is to create. Like that example here is a really complex rule. It can be implemented in the database, but honestly, this is an application level rule, as in you could change this depending on per customer even. You could set a different rule. You know, customer A gets 10%. Customer B gets 5%, that kind of thing. Okay, so now that the business rule talk is out of the way, let's go uh, talk about transforming data model to a physical model. So step one, you're gonna create a table for every entity. So you know we have your ERD, each of those square boxes becomes a table. You're gonna specify the primary key. This is at the point where you are allowed to create surrogate keys. So maybe what the candidate keys were gonna be in your conceptual design aren't very good. Like your candidate key is a person's SIN number or an email address or a phone number. These are all things that can change. Therefore, those are not good keys. They're called intelligent keys, but not they're not good keys. Therefore, you may want to consider using a surrogate key uh, to uh, generate a, a sequence of numbers instead. Uh, you may want to specif specify alternate keys. Uh, those actually become indexes. 
I'll talk about those in a minute. Then you specify specific properties for each column. So each attribute becomes a column and you're gonna specify whether or not it can be null, what data type it is, uh, default values if applicable, uh, data constraints if applicable. Uh, you're gonna verify normalization. We're gonna talk about normalization next week. Um, so I'll be talking about some of these other points in a minute. So you're also going to create relationships by creating foreign keys. A good design tool will create the foreign keys for you automatically. Uh, pretty much all modern design tools do it for you automatically. Uh, MySQL Workbench does it. It actually does an okay job of it. Um, Oracle's Designer, whatever it's called, I think it's just called Designer, it does a pretty good job of it too. Um, same thing with Microsoft SQL Server. Um, if you have ID dependent entities, you may have intersection tables or different association patterns. Um, relationships between strong entities and a weak entity will also be done. Uh, you may end up having some weird mixed relationships, uh, which I'll be talking about in a bit. Um, and then you're gonna specify logic for handling minimum cardinality. Again, one-to-one, -one, many to one, many to many. Um, so on the left, yes, left, is a conceptual table. On the right is literally just a normal table, except the only difference is we created a primary key. Yes. No, 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 my screen, that's why I had to, that's why you saw me double check, make sure that the orientation was the same. Yes, your left, the one that does not have the key. So you might see my cursor dead. So this is left, this is right. So we're on the same left and right. On the left is a conceptual table, which is why, remember I was talking about how a lot of design tools now are going away from the, the Chen style diagrams, the square boxes and the ellipses, because they can just draw a box and let you type everything in and then later on just convert it by letting you put in the extra attributes for what the field ha the table has. So the only difference you'll see here is that a primary key has been defined. So the, the actual, in the conceptual diagram, employee number is a, is a candidate key. It's an identifier, but it's not the primary key. When it becomes the table, it is a, marked as a primary key. So the ideal primary key is short, numeric, and fixed. So you want to try to avoid primary keys that are long strings of data. Because, well, for a few reasons. Uh, number one, computers are really good with numbers. It might come as a shock to you, but computers are really good with numbers. They really suck at text. So, it's able to, uh, a database server is able to find a record by number much faster than it can by letters. So if you know that a primary key is only integers, which it should be, and you say, I want record 32,500 something, it knows roughly where to jump and start looking for it. On the other hand, if your primary key is a person's email address, okay, so Daniel Doug, Goudreau at some email.com. It's literally going to start looking. Can you give me everything that starts with D. Okay, now we got all the Ds. Now, can we find all of our DA, DAN, DNIE? And it's got to compare until it compares the entire string. String lookups are slow. Even if they're indexed, they're still going to be slower than numeric lookups. So, ideally, you'll want to use something called surrogate keys. Uh, they're also known as synthetic keys. Um, different database textbooks use different terms, but they mean the same thing. A surrogate key um, is ideal, but some people say there's two disadvantages for end users. One, they have no meaning to the end user. An ID uses surrogate key gives no indication of the related day table. This is mental thinking from the 1980s. It means who cares if the end user knows what the number means? Most of the time, they're never going to see the number. Like, seriously, they're not. The, the only surrogate keys you'll see on your day-to-day -day life are 
invoice numbers, receipt numbers, student number, maybe a driver's license, depending where you're from. Even though, you know, in Canada and Ontario, driver's licenses, half the numbers are date of birth. You know, there's only so much they use in there. Yeah, it's, honestly, who cares? There's That's not a valid excuse. Like, story keys are fantastic for that because realistically, people don't care. Like, if you have a drop down on a form with all the countries listed and you pick Canada, do you care what the magic number behind the scenes is? No. You just pick Canada, the computer figures out the magic number for you. Now, the second point is valid. When the data is shared across data, different databases, so for example, a company's got three different databases and they use similar data structures or and or they use the exact same data structure and they have sorted keys in all of them, then you sometimes have problems where the same number might get generated in two different systems at the same time. Theoretically, yes, that could be similar. Uh, but in this case, well, those are real world numbers. Uh, in this case, it's synthetic. So you've got a company with four locations. So four, this is not as much a problem nowadays as it used to be, but there once was a time where every store had its own transaction records. So every day, Loblaws would close its doors. The cash registers, the computers in the back office would add up all the day's sales, batch them up, and send them to the, to the head office at the end of the day. It was called closing the books or closing the data set for the day. Now, what would happen is you've had two different stores and they had similar number of transactions. Some of the surrogate keys could be the same in each store. So, you know, transaction 52, transaction 52 in two different stores. There's ways of handling that. This one of the biggest risks with surrogate keys is if you are going to have a distributed database. Is it really an issue? Not really. There's ways around it. Uh, it's kind of gross the way you do it, but there are ways around it. Uh, one of them is having a surrogate key plus an instance ID, so that let's say um, Loblaws over here, store number 3,307, 3307. So every row and every table would be 3307 space and then the surrogate key. So they'd have two, two, it'd be a compound key, one with the store, one with, you know, the generated number. And that takes care of that problem. So there are ways around it. You can still use your surrogate keys. It's just, you have to plan for it in the future. Um, so. The term a candidate key and an alternate key are synonyms. Um, candidate keys are alternate identifiers. In other words, there's other ways you could find someone. And I will be completely honest with you guys right now. This notation they're showing on the screen, I've only ever seen it in this textbook. I've been working in the industry for 26, 27 years. And this textbook's the only place I've ever seen this notation. Uh, I have never actually seen a database tool that lets you actually put those in. So. What they're putting in here is a notation of uh, alternative key n dot m. n is the number of the alternate key. The m is the column number. So if we look at the customers, a really good example of this, they're saying, okay, we know customer number is our primary key. When we were designing the system originally, and we decided to, before we create a synthetic key called customer number, we said, well, we could find someone by the combination of their name and the city or by their email address. So the name and city was a compound key. So it's alternate key one, the name being dot one and the city being dot two. So in theory, we could look up a customer by name and city as a potential alternate key. Um, email address was also a choice and it's alternate key two, element one. Um, essentially, these alternate keys are something you want to document. So that later on you can create, when I talk to you guys about indexes in two weeks, uh, basically anything that would be an alternate key would become an index instead. So these uh, indexes are behind the scenes structures to help things go faster. Shoot, man, that was the entire lecture on indexes. <laughs> Summarized. Um, but yeah, so those are alternate keys. Now, null status. Null is 
Actually, a very important one. So far, everything's been a little vague. Null is important. <clears throat> Null determines whether or not a value must be supplied when the record is created. So if a column is marked as not null, that means that when you add a row to the database, any value in a column marked not null must have a value. So employee number must have a value. Employee name must have a value. We don't need their phone number or email address. Their hire date is not null. In other words, we're going to add an employee into the record, into the database. We don't know what their phone extension number is yet. We don't know what the corporate email address is yet, but they've been hired. So that means we know. I need to know their employee number, their name, and when they were hired. Everything else is optional at record creation. Later on, we can always update and add values in there, or we could even take the values out. But the name, number, and the hiring date is are required. And then we assign data types. So we have varying data types. And these are the generic ones for the most part. Now you got to be careful when you look at these generic ones because um, whoever wrote these slides included two data types from Microsoft SQL Server. Um, they're not they're not all that generic. So character car n is the generic n car is from Microsoft SQL Server. So car it means character, and character n means it will hold a string alphanumeric of set length. So if you say car five, it will always occupy five spaces in the data, like five spaces in the database, no matter what. Even if you put in just the letter A, it will pad it until it's five. So it'll be A, and then a bunch of a bunch of spaces more or less to make sure it's full. Um, N card, the Microsoft SQL server means it's nationalized characters. In other words, if it was a car field in almost every database system and you we go and you shove in Japanese into it, some of the Japanese characters take up the room of two characters in the database. Chinese, same thing, various other, you know, languages that have that don't use an alphabet per se, but have a character set instead, will do that. NCAR means it literally stores one space for every character regardless of how many bytes it actually occupies. Um, so car isn't cool because it, it's fixed length. It was created back in the day when computers ran on tape. If you remember watching any older movies where the computers are going and the tape drive, like you see the big wheels full of tape going back and forth while they're processing the information. Well, the thing was about the fields were set to a specific length. The computer knew how much tape to move. So it's going to go, oh, this is car five. Position one, whoop, it's going to skip to the end to get the next record, skip to the end to get the next record, because it always knows exactly how far to move that tape for five characters. Solid state storage, nothing moves anymore. So a bit later, somebody who was quite smart came up with something called a var car, varying character length fields. And var cars are fields that have a maximum length but they only store, they only occupy the space used by the data, plus like a couple of bytes, uh, like plus a couple of bits at the end, uh, like a termination bit. So if we do a varcar 25 and we put in the letter A, it will occupy one byte plus a little bit. And like I say a little bit because each database server does that last little bit differently. So someone will store like an escape character, someone will store like a binary Bell, I think that's what Oracle does, is after all the letters are in there, it actually stores the uh, a binary character in there, and it's equivalent to the sound of a bell. Uh, there's an S character that says bell and actually makes your computer go ding. That's what they used to use, at least, to mark the end of a varcar field. Um, for a long time, car fields were considered faster than varcar, but computer systems have evolved so much in the last 30 years that there is functionally no performance difference between a car field and a varcar. So the rule of thumb is use a car field if it's only one or two characters. For anything else, use a var car. Uh, date. One is nationalized. So it means that 
A regular VAR car, each character will occupy one byte. The issue, for example, with Chinese is some of the characters occupy up to three bytes. So if you go VAR car 10 and you start putting in Chinese characters, it will hold 10 bytes. So it might hold three, four Chinese characters. N car will store 10 Chinese characters. It, it's based on the character, not on the space the character occupies. Uh, so you have date. I think you guys could probably figure out what goes in a date field. Uh, time, same deal. It's a time, 24 hour clock, uh, which makes it easy for almost everybody in the world except North Americans. Um, there is a data type called date time, sometimes called timestamp, depending on the database system. It holds both a date and a time at the same time. It's pretty self-explanatory. Integers. Must I explain integers? I hope you guys know what integers are. Um, okay, so now we have decimal numeric and money. You'll notice that they look like they're declared the same way. Decimal and numeric are aliases of each other. They are the exact same thing inside the database server. So if you declare a field with decimal, 10 comma two, it's the same thing as a numeric 10 comma two. Some database servers use decimal, some use numeric. I've yet to have seen a single database server that does not respect both. So regardless, as long as you pick one or the other, it'll work everywhere. Um, so decimal numeric work in the sense of you specify the length and then how many decimal places of precision. Um, I'll actually write this one on the board. Or else I get two red ones. So if I go uh, numeric five comma two, this means that it can hold a total of nine digits with two reserved for the decimal place. So this is the five. I should have gone lower with this. Okay, let's go like this. Let's go. This is the two, this is the five. So these are handy when you're dealing with monetary units. Um, yes, you'll see a money data type. Money data type is not universal. Not all database systems have a money type. So usually you'll use a decimal or numeric. Um, they are essentially all the same thing. Uh, they allow positive negative values. Um, what's really cool about these ones is that it, the database server will do the rounding for you. Um, as I've discovered over the years, students really suck at rounding. Humans in general suck at rounding. Uh, they seem to not understand how rounding works. Uh, so you're better off letting the computer do the work for you. So if I were to have a number that's, you know, five comma two, and I were to shove into it, 15, 4, 9, 3, 1, 4. It'll round this, which by the way, will be 14 point, 15 point four nine, because all these numbers are less than five. So we just drop it, but it would take care of rounding this all the way up. So if this number instead was six here, this would become like that because it takes care of the rounding for you. Exploit the data types in the database server. It means there's less code you have to write in your application. Okay, I am not gonna go through all MySQL's data types. And these are just some of the common ones. Um, there's just some handy ones in here you might wanna know. Uh, there's the option for a bit, which is one to 64. Um, there's tiny int. And tiny it unsigned, you'll notice that anything that's an integer can be unsigned, which means it'll actually hold one more value more. It sounds like one more value more, but it really is. It's 0 to 255 for, for a tiny. Whereas if you allow a negative, it's nine, minus 128 to 127. If you look at it and you take the negative sign off, it literally is 255. It's just it's centering the value across 0. Um, and you go, you got all the way up to a big int, which you can see this big fat number right there. Um, float, float 
real or double, uh, those are high precision uh, decimal places. You got date, date, time, timestamp, uh, time, and year. Those are all the different time data types you have. Uh, when you design a database, you want to pick a data type that makes sense. Uh, as far as string characters go, you have car and var car, which I talked about. Uh, blob, stay away from blobs. Binary large objects, don't use blobs. They're terrible. Uh, they have only one purpose, and is if you need to store something in a binary format in the database directly. And the only place I've ever seen a valid use for that is in a system that does translation between languages. So that you don't have to worry about the character set of the table, you just shove in the raw, by, the raw bits for whatever language you're putting in. You want to shove Portuguese into the database? Fantastic, put in the Portuguese letters into a, into a blob field. It won't care because it's going to treat it as binary information, not as actual characters. Um, there's a uh, text and you're this missing also uh, tiny text and big text. I'll give you a guess. One's small, one's medium, one's large. Um, enum and a set. Uh, those are the common data types you'll find in MySQL. Um, other database servers give you all kinds of other data types that are cool. Uh, Postgres allows you to store geometry in the database, which is really cool. They got a data type called circle. And you feed it X and R. So X, Y, and then R, and it knows it's a circle that's a certain size and a certain position on a map, which is why it's used for a lot of mapping. So here's our employee table after we've applied null status and data types. Our employee number is an integer, it's not null. Our employee name is a varchar 50, not null. That means we can store up to 50 characters for a person's name. Uh, that will cover a significant amount of people. Personally, I always go for 100. Um, I've had, I had a student from Puerto Rico once whose name was insanely long because he had five first names, three middle names, and then his last name. Uh, apparently it's a Puerto Rico thing or at least Hispanic America thing. Um, it was fun. Um, phone numbers, character 15, because, you know, North American phone numbers are fifth, well, 14 characters, technically. Um, email address, 100 characters long, nullable, hire, hire date. Who cares what time they got hired at? We just care about when they were hired. Uh, review date, same thing. And employee code, uh, character 18. I'm guessing that in this system, whatever the employee code happens to be, it's always 18 characters long. Okay, so then we want to set default values. And there's a few ways of handling default values. The item number could be a surrogate key. So the default value would be a generating data from a surrogate key. And depending on the database server, how that number gets generated changes. MySQL has a modifier for a field called auto increment. You can only have one of those per table. Auto increment, you know, automatically increments a number. So one, two, three, four, five. Uh, Microsoft SQL Server does something similar. Postgres and Oracle, on the other hand, they use something called the sequence. Um, so if anybody here has ever run track and field or whatever, you've seen people that are counting laps and every time you go by, they click a button to count how many times you've gone around the track. That's a sequence because once you hit the click, it can never go back. Or you go get a, you know, you want to go get a number to go get help at the IT desk here. You know, you pull a number out of the machine, it gives you a number, whatever your number happens to be that day. Congratulations. That number is never going to get reused that day. That's a sequence. Um, then we have a table here, category has no default value. Item prefix. So, we can set up rules in the database, at the database level, that says if the category is set to perishable, then it's always going to create a P as a prefix to the item and import it for I, one off. Oh, otherwise it's a no prefix. There once was a time where this was an approved way or a really good way of doing it because the database servers tended to be much more optimized than the application servers. The problem is that if you suddenly want to add a new category, you have to modify the database. 
which means while you're modifying the database, the database goes offline. That means it's not processing anymore. There, there's always a risk that it's going to damage something and you lose the database. So it's even updating a new item prefix could be a several minute to hour process where you back up the database, take the system offline, update the rule, check it's good, bring the system back online, test that it's good. Uh, nowadays, you tend to do this in the application. Um, approving department, same deal. If the item prefix is I, it's shipping and purchasing. Otherwise, it's just purchasing. Uh, shipping method, if item prefix is P, ships next day. Otherwise, it ships ground. So you can see that all these rules are building on each other. Uh, these are basically business rules. You can almost turn these into sentences. Um, different database servers will do these rules by default. Um, so a few other common um, default values you'll see is if you have a Boolean field, which MySQL does not, but almost everybody else does. Uh, I'm assuming you guys know what a Boolean is. True, false, yes, no. A common one is to set a default on your Booleans so that you never have a unknown Boolean. So it's either defaults to true, defaults to false. Otherwise, you could actually put a record in with a null value on a Boolean, which is really cool because database is the only place in the world where you have three values for a Boolean. Yes, no, and I don't know. No, really. True, false, null. Yes, no, I don't know. Right? It's not, not really a Boolean, is it? When you can actually give it a third value. So usually when we design a database, we tend to give default values to our Booleans. Um, other ones that have common uh, defaults are dates. So for example, if you have a column that determines when a record gets created, you don't want to trust the application to set that timestamp. You want to get the database to do it. So you could set the default for a timestamp field to current timestamp or current date time, or there's a function called now. So now, depending on what system you use. And so these are samples of what defaults could be that you'd use in the system. Uh, these are usually implemented by the business rules. So a business rule will say, uh, an order must record when it is created. Therefore, if it must record when it's created, that means the database should be setting the you know, creation date on the order. That's a business rule that determines a default. All right, so then we have data constraints. Data constraints are limitations on data values. Um, domain constraints limit column values to a particular set of values. So you could set, um, so a domain constraint would be more not necessarily data type. It's determining what data is allowed in that column. Um, rarely is that done in the database itself. It's usually done at the application. Uh, an example would be if a field is first name, the domain constraint would be that's a first name that goes in that field, not a date. Uh, range constraints, on the other hand, uh, can limit values to a particular interval of values. So, for example, um, if you have a uh, help desk system of some sort, and there's a field that's set for priority scale of 1 to 10. We could set a range constraint saying, this field's never allowed to be more than 10. Not allowed to be less than 1, and it can never be more than 10. Uh, Interrelational constraints. Uh, that is when a column's value is determined by the value of another column in the same table. So that's, the these ones here are intrarelational. So the item prefix is determined by the category. The approving department is determined by the prefix. The shipping method is determined by the prefix. That's intrarelational. In other words, it's determined by within itself. Interrelational limits a column's value based on a values in another table. Usually, this is known as a foreign key. So when we're creating a physical database, when you create the parent record, and then you're going to add a child record, the foreign key's value must match what the parent record's primary key is. That means that the value in the child table is an interrelational. In other words, its value is determined outside itself. Thus, it is a foreign key because its value comes from a source foreign to itself. 
outside itself, so it's form. All right, so creating relationships for a one-to-one -one strong entity. Uh, back to the whole um, member locker, or let's go with student locker, which apparently nobody in this room has a locker. It still shocks me. Uh, my God, they're like 15 bucks a term. Um, so the strong entities of club membership and locker, um, they are, it's a one-to-one -one relationship. They're both strong entities because they can both exist without each other. And we basically create a foreign key in the locker table, which basically takes the member number from here and it'll populate this. And you can see that it's marked as a forward key. And they also marked it as an alternative key because it's a one-to-one -one relationship. It's a safe bet that you can find the locker if you look up the person's student number. Or if you look up the locker number, you can find out what student number has it. So you can go both ways with it. Um, there's also the option to go the other way around, which you can put the locker number in the members table because it's a one-to-one -one relationship, they'll either the either solution will work. It's literally literally a matter of preference at this point because well it's one to one. So you can never have more than one locker per member and you can never have more than one member per locker. So you just pick which one you want to have the, the foreign key in and you roll with it. Um it honestly makes no difference either direction. So on the other hand, when you're creating a one-to-many strong relationship, the primary key will be on one side of the relationship and the many side is the foreign key, also known as the one with the um, primary key is the parent, the one with the foreign key is the child. And it would look like something like this. So the first one is the conceptual diagram. It's saying that the member has zero, one, or more uniforms. So when we do the physical of it, the we make a primary key for the member number. We have a primary key on the uniform ID. But then when we create the foreign key, we also include the member number in the child table. Because it's one to many, at this point now the relationship makes a difference which place it goes. Because otherwise, if we flipped it, that would mean that a uniform can belong to many people. Each person can only ever have one uniform. So the big difference between one-to-one -one and one-to-many is when it's one-to-one, -one, it doesn't make a difference which table you put the foreign key in. When it's one-to-many, the foreign key is always in the many. The one never has the foreign key of that relationship. Um, and then when you have a many-to-many -many relationship, there is no place for a foreign key in either table because you can't put... I've seen a database once where they did it, where they actually had the foreign keys of each other in each table. It was horrifyingly bad. Um, I had just started working for digital equipment at the time. So that's uh, 20, 24, 23 years ago. And they asked me to clean up this database. And I started looking at the data and go, oh, it looks pretty safe. I delete a record. And because it had cascading deletes set up, it deleted the first record, then deleted the parent record, which then triggered a delete on the other record. And it just literally went through the entire data, the two tables nuking each other. Like I ran a command that should have taken like half a second and it was still running five minutes later. I'm like, no, really, that's literally what I was doing. I'm going, I know the server's not fast, but it should have been done by now. <laughs> um, I had a backup. And uh, I spent the next five days breaking the relationships and creating new tables and rewriting parts of the application to make it work. Um, it was not a good time. So when they say there is no place for the foreign key in either table, it's saying that if it's a many-to-many -many relationship, neither table should have the foreign key. The solution to that is you create something called an intersection table, and it stores corresponding rows from each entity. Um, so it'll contain the primary keys of each table as a composite key. And the table's primary key also becomes a foreign key. It'll look like this. So we have 
Company, part, many to many. Pretty straightforward, right? A company can have many parts. Each part can be bought by many companies. If we want to turn it into a proper functional database, what we will do is create a new table. And basically it inherits the primary key of both parents. And both foreign keys are also part of the primary key. So it's a compound key. That's a primary key. That's also foreign keys. So it's an everything key. It's literally got every possible flag you can turn on. This allows you to say that each company can have each part once. So company Home Depot sells a um, certain kind of screw. I don't remember the name of the company, but they make really good construction screws. So home, so that company, Home Depot sells those screws. Lowe's also happens to sell those screws. The way that database would be is Home Depot screw, Lowe's same screw. It's saying that Home Depot can't have that, that screw twice in their system. Lowe's can't have that screw twice in the system. And vice versa, each screw can each screw can be assigned to Lowe's and to Home Depot. That's cool. But they can each have you know multiple screws, and each screw can belong to multiple companies. So this is known as an ID-dependent intersection table, um, also known as an associative entity, except the term intersection and associative gets used loosely around each other. They're not quite the same thing, but they are used uh, very commonly as the same thing. So for ID-dependent entities, we can use them to do many-to-many associative entities, uh, multi-valued attributes, and uh, archetype and instance relationships. That's not even something we cover in lecture, so we're going to skip that. Um, so associative relationships. So we already talked about intersection tables, which is basically has the two primary keys for the tables that feed in. You can even have three or four if you want it in there. Uh, but essentially, you've got a single table. All that's in it is foreign keys. So it allows you to map complex relationships between two tables or more. And primary keys are composite and they're also foreign keys. An associative table or an association table has is an intersect table plus it can have a little more. Like this. Man, that's small. I hope you guys have the slides up on your screen. So essentially this is the exact same we had before. So if I go back, you've got the company in the part and the table in the middle that maps them together. What's happening here is we added a price column. So now it became, it stopped being an intersection table. It became an associative table. What's the difference? An associative table is an intersection table plus a little extra stuff. It could have extra data in it. Um, to be completely honest, again, um, these kind, let me go back. This kind of intersection table is rare nowadays. Um, specifically because of uh, auditing rules in most corporations where we have to keep track of, when you create a database, you have to keep track of when a record was created, when a record was deleted, when a creator was modified, who did it? Like who added the record, who modified the record, who deleted the record? And you're thinking, well, if you're deleting the record, how can you keep track of that? There's ways. But the fact is that even this little table here will now have extra information in it as in who created that record. So there'll be a creation timestamp, a creation user ID, a last modified timestamp, last modified user ID. You don't see intersection tables very much in use setting because we need to track so much more data just for, you know, modern legal requirements that everything is an associative entity. Which leads me back to a lot of database people will use the term intersection table and an associative entity interchangeably because you, there's no such thing as an intersection table anymore unless you work in an industry where you don't need to keep track of this information. That's what it is. Um, and, you know, we got a really mangled version of this. So like I said before, we like I said, you could do this with three tables four tables, five tables, it makes no difference. It's just a bunch of foreign keys and then some values. <laughs> so, 
So and then we designed for maximum cardinality. So parent optional, child optional, mandatory ch optional, or optional mandatory. Uh, mandatory parent and child is easy-ish. Um, so on optional, optional, you don't need to do any extra rules. Everything is not, uh, everything allows nulls. It's optional. So in other words, and we're back to that whole locker situation where a student can exist without a locker and a locker can exist without a student kind of thing. So the student number and or locker number is optional and the foreign key. Um, so for optional, optional, we don't need to do anything. Um, so when you enforce minimum cardinality, if the parent is required, there's no action required on the parent, obviously, because you're going to add the parent first. When you try to insert a child record, if you don't supply the value that belongs to the parent, in other words, you're going to try to add an item to an order, but you haven't started an order yet. Um, I'm going to go back to McDonald's. Norm, I, 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 not that I've ever worked at McDonald's, but you know, I'm just going to go with what I've been told. Customer comes up and they want to buy something. You hit new order button on the screen. Then you can add, you know, the McDouble with extra pickles and um, Big Mac sauce. They won't let you add the, you know, the McDouble with extra pickles and Big Mac sauce unless you've hit new order first. It's saying that the parent, as in the order, must exist before you can add an item to the order. So that's literally what on insert. That's what has to happen. Now, if you want to modify the key, if you update the parent's primary key, you have to update the child's primary key. You're gonna that's gonna be prohibited because you can't have suddenly keys out of sequence anywhere else. Um, on the child, it's okay to change that key if there's already a parent that matches. Otherwise, it prohibits it. On the delete. Um, if you want to delete the parent record, you also have to delete the child records first. So if you want to get rid of the parent, you got to kill the kids. I say things like that so it helps you guys remember. I say horrible things like that just help you guys remember how this works. Um, so yeah, essentially you cannot delete a parent record unless the child records exist. So you have to delete the child records first to be able to delete the parent record. There are ways of setting cascade rules in a database saying, hey, on cascade, delete the child record. So you delete the parent, the kids just cease existing at the same time. Um, so on the parent, you can't add a parent if the parent is mandatory. I mean, if the child is mandatory without the parent. And it's like one of those chickens before the eggs moment where how can you add a child if the parent doesn't exist? And how can you add a parent if the child doesn't exist? So realistically, rarely will you see mandatory child optional parent because it can't happen. Um, and so if you're going to change the foreign keys, same deal. You're going to make sure that there's a child, et cetera, et cetera. Otherwise, you can delete the children or modify the children. Um, so here's a sample of a database for multiple companies. You've got a company that has phone contacts, departments, and employees. And it allows for cascading updates and deletes. So a cascading update is when the parent key is modified, it automatically updates the child's foreign key. Um, it's really not considered good practice anymore to allow that. But it is a thing. So, for example, if you used a person's SIN number as the primary key for the parent record, every child record must also have a copy of the SIN number. That means if suddenly your SIN number needs to change, it needs to change the SIN number for all the child records at the same time. There are not very good ways of doing this because most database systems will not let you change one, won't, won't let you change the parent unless you change the child, but you can't change the child unless the parent exists. So in most database systems, when you need to do something, what something like that, what it'll do is it'll take the parent, copy it, change the ID, 
then copy and then update all the child records to point to the new record, then delete the original parent. It sounds a little convoluted, right? Just for changing a primary key, which is why surrogate keys are a good thing. They come to the rescue because they never change because they have no real world meaning. Therefore, you have no reason to change the value of a primary key. Actually, some database servers won't let you, like Postgres. Um, if you set up your primary key, as, as I said, there's a, uh, an attribute called as generated. If you do as generated, it won't let you even change the values in that field. Like it'll say no, not unless you feed in override commands. So it just prevents you from doing bad things. Um, a cascading delete is when you delete the parent and it takes out the kids automatically. For a strong entity, you usually don't allow cascade deletes. So, um, again, if we're going to go back to the student and locker example, even though it's a one-to-one -one relationship, let's just say we have the foreign key for the student in the locker table. So we go and delete the student. If we allow it a cascade delete, it would also delete the locker. So on strong entities, you don't want to allow cascades. Then it depends if it's still associated to someone else. What would happen is if you deleted that customer and you deleted that address and it belong, it's also used by other by other customers, and then the cascade has a risk of starting. It's not used, then you can just delete it. That's fine. That's fine. Um, and regard on the other hand, for weak entities, you'll generally do cascades again, an order, and the order items. McDonald's, start a new order. Add two hamburgers, add a drink, add some fries, add two ice creams. Oh, no ice cream machine's not working today. For the, anybody who's ever experienced going to McDonald's and ice cream machine's not working, that was for you. So suddenly the person comes up, they tap their card, money doesn't work. They put their card in, doesn't work. They open their wallet, there's no money. The cashier will delete the order. So it'll delete the order and the items for the order because it wasn't a valid sale. So that is a weak entity. The order items, the hamburgers are the weak entity because they cannot exist without a matching order. Therefore, if you delete the order, you want to take out those order items. So that's the weak entity. Well, the other one I was using was the student and lockers, for example. A student can exist without a locker. A locker can exist without a student. Therefore, if you delete the student, you don't want to delete the locker so you don't cascade. That's, you know, no, that's a strong. Okay. All right. So to enforce minimum cardinality on many, on optional, optional, you do nothing. Uh, again, back to the student locker. The student's optional to the locker. And the locker is optional to the student. So therefore you do nothing. Um, many to optional. Um, you define their integrity constraints. You'd make the foreign key not null which means that you cannot delete um, the child without deleting the parent. Uh, optional to many, so optional parent, uh, mandatory child. Uh, it's difficult to enforce. You have to use triggers or application code. Realistically, it's not something you're ever going to put in the database. Uh, it's kind of pointless to do it because it's just so hard to implement. Um, many to many, it's... There's stuff on the parent, there's stuff on the child. They can be hard to enforce. Uh, you end up with complex triggers and you can actually lock each other out, which brings us back to the intersection table. So if you have an intersection table, you can delete the single row in the intersection table and that takes care of the many-to-many -many relationship. So if I go back to um, company and parts, a company has many parts, the part has many companies, and we decide with this part, that company that's, this particular screw is no longer available for purchase anywhere. We delete the part. It'll come in and delete the part from the association, but the companies still survive. They're fine. Thus, many to many is easy to deal with if you use an, inter uh, an intersection table. Otherwise, it's nightmarish. You can get into what they call a um, race condition, which is I want to delete this, so I have to delete this, but I want to delete this, so I have to delete this. Suddenly, both systems are saying, I need to kill you. And nobody succeeds. It, the whole system just locks up. Okay.
So that's the part about the physical implementation. Now I'm going to just pull up MySQL Workbench really quick to um, show you guys a little bit of that stuff. It's coming. My laptop is slow as molasses when I'm recording my screen. Don't know why. But if I'm not recording, everything loads really fast. So MySQL Workbench diagramming is over here. It's fun. The leg of my tri my little tripod's blocking off part of my screen. That's where the buttons are that I needed. Then you add a diagram. And in here, I'm going to create a new table. I'm going to call it, uh, uh, let's go with uh, um, company. Sorry about the small font, guys. There's nothing I can do for it. ID. And in MySQL, to make a surrogate key, you'll notice I just checked off something called AI, which stands for auto increment, which means it'll just do a clicker and just roll up automatically. And then I'm going to add a uh, name, and it's not Campana. And varicar 50, good enough. I'm going to add a new table called um, where did my other table go? It's over here. Um, I'm going to call this one parts. I'm sure your conversation is really interesting, but it can wait a little bit till I'm done. If it's distracting me at the front, it's distracting the people around you too. And I'm going to do an automatic on the ID. And I'm going to give this part name. Also, Varkar45 is good. It's not null. You will notice some of the different colors of the diamonds on the screen. Wow, that's small for you guys. Hang on, let me see if I can make this bigger. This way. No, this one. There we go. Okay, primary keys show up as a key. Things that are optional show up as a clear diamond, blue diamond. Things that are mandatory show up as a blue, solid blue diamond, or whatever color that is. Okay, so I am going to add uh, one more table to show you guys the uh, one-to-many relationship. So I'm going to go another table here. I'm going to call this one uh, staff ID. I'm going to give the person a name. <coughs> I'm a big fan of big long names. Whoa, not 4100. Not not 199. There we go, 100. Uh, the name is not null. Email, uh, Varkar, 100 also. Um, and we'll leave that one as is. So now to make the relationships, we have a few different tools. And this one is for uh, strong entities, non-identifying. So could we have staff without a company? We'll say, in theory, yes, we could use the non-identifying. So you click on the child, click on the parent. You'll see what will automatically create the foreign key for you. It also makes sure it's matching the same data type. It will set up the, the rules here. Nice and nifty. You can edit the relationship by double clicking on it. And you can also say um, that the foreign key is optional, which will now give us our happy little crow's foot. <laughs> a company can exist without staff. Cool. Now MySQL does something very, very nice. And this actually showed up in version eight of the design tool. Before that, you used to have to do this manually. Many to many. Click on one, click on the other. It created the intersection table for you automatically. So you know that little diagram earlier that we had on the screen that showed the company and the parts and had the association table automatically in the middle? MySQL Workbench will make it for you. So when you have a conceptual diagram that shows many to many, you can just get MySQL to take care of it for you. You can, of course, come in and modify this so that you know you can follow whatever nomenclature your company uses. Uh, I can change this to uh, I can now turn it into an associative entity. 
with a uh, decimal eight comma two um, release date, which would be a date field. And uh, we could add a created field, which would be a, a date time field with a default of now, which is a function. Now, you can't see the defaults on this screen. You can only see it when you edit the table or you were to extract the SQL for it. Then you'd see um, you could see in theory where you've got the default now in here. You'll be learning about the SQL side of it after, like, after the break. The associative entity? Sure. Um, I'll create a new one. Okay. So, yep. Yeah, well, I did many to many. You click on one, click on the other, and it just creates it. Try that again. The second, oh, the many, many is not dotted. So dotted is for non-identifying relationships. Those are for strong entities. So in theory, you could have a staff member that is not assigned to a company. This actually does happen in the real world where a company um, has, anybody here ever heard of staffing agencies? Okay, I've worked for them. It's a shitty way to make money. Um, you get paid whatever, $18 an hour, they get paid $28 an hour for your time. Uh, yes, I did it. I've been there, um, not bitter. Um, so for example, this staff could be employees as a staffing agency, but they haven't been assigned to a company yet. Therefore the staff can exist by itself. So it's a strong entity. The company exists by itself because it's also a strong entity, but it's a one to many as in a company can hire many staff, but it's optional because the staff is not defined by the company. So that's the difference between the dashed line and the solid line. Uh, if you wanted, if I wanted to make this an identifying relationship, I could take this out. And if you delete that, it takes care of the foreign key and I could go one to many. And you'll see that the symbol is different now beside the company ID. It has made the company ID be part of the primary key because it's identifying. So it, this staff table now has a composite primary key or compound key. That is the ID of the staff member plus the company ID they work for. So those are the three sets of tools in this. Um, literally, this is the second part of, that's like the last part of your assignment is this, is what I just did on the screen. Uh, if you've done the conceptual diagram right, and you did everything else right, this one's fast. You just gotta make sure you don't screw up. Um, and the last bit is you can export this as, um, as a script, because the assignment tells you, I want you to exclude the script. So if I go Ford engineer as a script, uh, you just uh, give it a name, I don't know. No, like this, dot SQL, and I go next, next, and you can see that it'll generate the code for this table. This is the, the actual commands the database would use to create the tables for you. The reason we ask for that is I can upload that into a code compare tool and see how many students cheated. As in, how many students, how many different groups submit the same assignment? <laughs> the identical assignment, because there should be no two groups with identical assignments. Uh, so that's what we use this for. Also, it also allows us to check for um, the spot where we say, you know, you got to set a, a constraint, like a default value on one of the fields. With this, we can quickly pop open your file and search for the word default and see if you set a default value. So, you know, for the grading criteria. And then when you hit finish, it creates the file like this. So if I go to my desktop and I say uh, edit with, my little foot's are really in a terrible place. There it is. So you take that and you submit that as part of your assignment. Okay, so that's the talk about physical design. So basically put the biggest part of the physical design is you create your attributes, set your values, 
set your foreign keys, make sure you use the right kind of foreign key, um, that kind of thing. Um, next week, we will be talking about normalization, such an exciting topic. Um, it's just making sure your database structure is actually sane. Um, and I will also talk about uh, a little more about data types, um, depending on how long that lecture takes. Um, and I'll also be releasing the first information about your midterm test, um, because you're gonna have a midterm test. That's how it goes. Um, just for those of you that have to book in Cal, this is important. So if anybody in here needs to book Cal for their test, book it for the same time. Like your test will be in this room on paper, which means if you're gonna book for Cal, you gotta book this time in Cal. And I need to have the booking information soon so I can submit the midterm to them. So it's ready for you to take. So I don't know how many people in here book their test through Cal. I don't think I even got a single letter of accommodation, but in case there are, you should let me know so that I can make the appropriate arrangements. All right, that's it, folks. Good to go.